Welcome to week seven. As we have seen, the Roman Empire fell into the hands of the so-called barbarians from the north, and now we turn our attention to the land of the barbarians, which is now known as Europe. However, at the time, there was no such thing as Europe, and the countries we are familiar with today, such as Great Britain, France, Spain, or Germany, did not even exist. The very notion of a country is a concept that did not come into being until the modern period. Today, we are entering medieval Europe. The term Middle Ages stemmed from the belief that Europe from the end of the Roman Empire until the dawn of the modern period was in its dark ages. However, this notion is misguided and we will see a cultural period that is brilliantly complex and diverse, rather than shadowy or dark. Most of the barbarians adopted Christianity as they came into contact with the Roman Empire in the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries. Remember, while we are looking at medieval art in Northern Europe, the Byzantine Empire that we've already seen was alive and well, and it's influencing Europe. There is cross-pollination between the different cultures united by Christian faith. The Northern Europeans bring their own artistic traditions and pagan religions to the mix. In the far north, the Scandinavians were never part of the Roman Empire and were some of the last to adopt Christianity, not until the 10th and 11th centuries. They worked in the so-called animal style, which dominated the arts by the 5th century. Much of our knowledge of cultures from the early Middle Ages in Europe comes from discovery of their jewelry, because jewelry could last a lot longer than a lot of other things. One example of the animal style is shown here in the Gummersmarch brooch from Denmark in the 6th century. Art of the animal style often represented abstract serpents, four-legged beasts, animals. The style also included exposed ribs and spinal columns, and animals dis depicted fully in profile or from above. Another feature is the symmetry of the work. In this brooch, a straight line of symmetry can be drawn right down the middle, and the left and right hand sides mirror one another. Metalwork is very finely crafted, of course, but a book offers even more possibilities. On the British Isles, Celtic Christians develop their own liturgical practices and distinct artistic traditions because they had very little contact with Rome until the 6th century. Their own artistic traditions prevail visibly in their illuminated manuscripts, where they're able to use paint to create even more detail in lyricism. Illuminated manuscripts made by hand on vellum or parchment made from animal skins often took years for monks and nuns to complete. The carpet page, like the carpet page shown here, is usually a purely decorative page. It's named the carpet page because it resembles a carpet, the design of a textile. On the carpet page of the earliest surviving illuminated manuscript from England, the ornamental tradition of the British Isles displays itself. Here we see the decorative, abstract animal patterns that make up this tradition. They are at once wild and organic, and in that way the, the work is as complex as nature itself. Two of the most exquisite man illuminated manuscripts are the Lindisfarne Gospel and the Book of Kells. One of the reasons that these books took so long to make, and were so precious, is that they were painted on vellum. Besides the fact that the painting itself took a long time, vellum is made from drying animal skin. And if you imagine that every time you needed a piece of paper, you had to slaughter a calf and dry its skin you obviously would not be using paper as often as you do today, so the process made the books very rare. The Book of Kells, pictured here, was produced on vellum. The Book of Kells reveals once again the decorative tra traditions of the British Isles. The decorative motifs amplify the text and give it its importance, so the letters here are given importance through these decorative motifs. And the tradition of these motifs come out of the animal style, and they show the importance of local tradition in monastic life in the 8th century. So, on the British Isles, people were bringing their own traditions 
to the Christian faith. But Christianity originally came from Rome, and of course Rome is influential as well. So here we see a comparison between two different styles, both inspired by Roman art. They reveal different interpretations of, Roman, of the Roman artistic tradition. Both images come from the same Roman prototype. They are inspired by the same Roman image, but they interpret it in a different way. So they're both basing, um, they're both based off of the same image, but they look very different. Ezra on the right is situated in a space, whereas Matthew on the left sits against a, fl a blank, flat background. So there's no space within his image. Only his bench and the carpet at his feet and the curtain provide a context for where he is, although Ezra is in an illusionistic space. You already see perspective. He's also had a model. He has modeled features. And there's an illusion created through shading. Three-dimensional modeling and a sense of space come from Rome, while the flat and decorative, decorative tradition of the British, British Isles asserts itself even as the artist acknowledges Rome by basing the image off of the Roman prototype. Northern Europe is influenced by Rome, but it is far enough away to retain its own cultural uniqueness. The page illustrating Matthew writing his gospel from the Lindisfarne Gospel book demonstrates the artist intentionally suppresses classical styles to emphasize local artistic tradition. Let me say that again. The page illustrating Matthew writing his gospel from the Lindisfarne Gospel demonstrates the artist's intentionally suppressed classical style to emphasize local artistic tradition. So he's inspired by the classical style, but he also intentionally suppresses it to emphasize the local tradition. In Spain, something else is going on. Islamic Moors ruled in Spain from the year 711 until 1492. For the most part, they tolerated Christians and Jews, and Christians in the Muslim territories were called Mozarabs, which is a term related to the Arabic, Arabic word Mustarab, which means would-be Arab. So Christians from this, in this region form um, their own style, uniting Christian forms with the artistic style of Muslim culture. So here's another Mozarabic image with very brilliant colors and a strike and striking narrative elements. And we will see the influence of Mozarabic art on work that we will look at later on. In Scandinavia, seafaring bands of Norsemen were called Vikings or people from the coves. And the Vikings began to descend on the rest of Europe in the 8th century, attacking and colonizing vast territories. They even destroyed Iona and the church at Lindisfarne, where some of the illuminated books we have seen were produced. So places that were producing these beautiful books were then attacked by the Vikings. This ship would not have been meant for the sea, but for the fjords inland. And two women were buried in this ship a practice based in a belief that a warrior would be welcomed into Valhalla, the hall of the slain, where a pantheon of gods abided. The boat symbolically represents a sea serpent with a spiral tail. Wooden buildings and works of art often do not survive over time, but this stave church is different. The Scandinavians had plenty of wood, and along with log cabins, the same kind of log, log cabins we think of today, they built stave churches. The timber churches that survive in rural Norway are called stave churches, from the four huge staffs that form their structural core. Interestingly, the builders of this church seem to want to cover all their bases, fending off trolls and demons, with the dragon sculptures that you can see here, as well as crosses, as you can see here. Belief in little creatures and um, 
demons continued into the 20th century in Scandinavia, and possibly even to this day. In Iceland, a company must have the site that it wants to build on surveyed to make sure that it has none of the rocks traditionally associated with elves. So that continues to this day. The Vikings eventually declined in power, and Charlemagne established a dynasty known as the Carolingian Empire. Charlemagne came from, from a family that emerged in France and Germany, and his empire extended through present-day Germany, France, Bel Belgium, Holland, and Italy. He was crowned the Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope. As the Christian Emperor, distinct from the other Roman Empire, which was still based in Byz Byzantium, in Constantinople. So he's the Holy Roman Emperor. This crowning also helped bolster the Pope's own power. The small equestrian statue shown here is based off of the statue of the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, shown on the right which at the time was thought to represent Constantine, the first Christian Roman emperor. So this statue makes it very clear how Charlemagne's grandson was fashioning his image and what he would like to be associated with. He obviously wants to be associated with Constantine, the first Roman emperor. At the same time, the sculpture is not an exact copy of the statue of Marcus Aurelius but it's done in a distinctly northern European style. So life in the Middle Ages for the average person was very short and very brutal. Hunger and famine often plagued northern Europe because their population was growing, but they did not have the agricultural know-how and technology for the land to yield enough food for the population. People were almost always hungry. The stratification was enormous. Only the wealthy could hope to not go hungry, but even their lives were short by today's standards. In the year 1000, life expectancy was 24 years. Now, of course, this is in part due to the fact that infants died so often. The infant mortality rate was extremely high. So whatever problems you face today, however difficult things are in your life, at least you know that you don't have to worry about many of the things that were daily struggles in the year 1000, such as famine and starvation. And most people in the medieval period still lived as peasants. And peasants had no way to protect themselves against barons and earls and rulers who might attack randomly. On the plus side, there was among the peasants, an organic solidarity. Average people stuck together because they needed one another to survive. Survival was uncertain and life was violent and short. However, the few who controlled the wealth, such as the kings, did not think twice about making a book cover out of gold, such as this one shown here. Gold was prized because of its ability to reflect the light. It enhanced and magnified the light. The graceful angels here in, on this cover and the details shown here are influenced by the expressive style of the Utrecht Psalter, an illustrated book of psalms with lyrical and elegant drawings of figures, as you can see in the details shown here. So these angels have some of the same lyricism as the angels here. Thus, the animated poses of the angels and mourners on the cover of the Lindau Gospel, this cover here, are similar to the energetic expressionism of the Utrecht Psalter. In the early 11th century, William the Conqueror, Duke William II of Normandy, invaded England and became king, allying England with Normandy, Normandy, which is in France, and then building the power of the church in order to solidify his own power. So he supports the church so that they will support him. Religious and secular power become intertwined. Slowly during this period, the centers of power as we know them today begin to develop. Slowly, Northern Europe is beginning to be able to feed itself. Into intellectual life in the Romanesque period involved the establishment of the first universities in towns still famous for their universities in the cities of Bologna, Paris, Oxford, and Cambridge. 
out of this milieu comes the Romanesque, as it is so called in the 19th century for the resemblance of its newly developed stone buildings to Roman buildings. There are a few identifying features of the Romanesque. One feature of Romanesque architecture is the use of the rounded arch, as you can see here, the rounded arch which is influenced by Roman architecture. The ceilings of churches were now made out of stone instead of wood. Stone masonry has become very popular because stone, stones are very durable and there's a capacity for protection. A new class of masons was developing along with other trades. The Church of San Vicens from the early 1000s is an example of an early Romanesque building or the so-called First Romanesque, because it relies on stone vaulting on the ceiling and masonry construction, and the church's stone masonry and rounded arches are inspired by Roman architecture, as I've said. The construction is based on transverse arches divided into bays. The bays are the sections of the vaulting. We must also, within the Romanesque period, try to understand the importance of pilgrimage. In the Middle Ages, pilgrimages became very important. People could go on pilgrimages as penance for their sins, or as a way to show their devotion to God. Often the relics of a holy site were seen to have healing power, and so people might travel in order to seek healing. Pilgrims went to Jerusalem and Rome, the obvious holy sites of Jerusalem, obviously, and Rome, where the church was based, and they also went to Santiago, Spain. Churches along the route to Santiago cropped up to accommodate pilgrims who would need a place to stay. And these churches attracted visitors by their stunning architectural innovations and their sculptural art. Pilgrimage was a kind of tourism. It exposed pilgrims to different cultures. At the end of the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, the Church of St. James awaited those who made it.